I'm going to give you a scenario that happened just a few weeks ago prior to our delegation actually visiting Russia. Uh, I don't know if you guys are aware of the fact that the Port of Iberia, basically uh, what we do is fabricate top sides of platforms. And uh, we lost a billion dollar project to a foreign entity, a foreign country. So normally uh, those top sides are divvied up between three parish, Iberia, Vermilion, and St. Martin. So to lose a billion dollars uh, in our economy is huge. So uh, we wrote a letter and uh, the state of Louisiana took that letter and they uh, forwarded it over to our delegation, only to find that our delegation wasn't able to act on that letter because they were in Russia at the time. So business is here is not being taken care of, but business in Russia is being taken care of, and I just don't approve of it. Thank you, Mr. Reader. Mr. Thomas? I think we must um, look at the reasons uh, why America is in these conflicts overseas and why uh, when you put Russia and America in the same sentence, it's so important. Right now, we're in conflicts in the Middle East because of Syria. Syria is the, uh, the country where they're trying to bring uh, pipes through, pipings for natural gas. And that's why you have so, much, so many conflicts with Iran and with Iraq and the different um, Saudi Arabia, the different countries in the Middle East, competing to see who would get that bid for the pipelines for natural gas going through Syria. So in that effect, I believe that's why America is in Russia right now. And I believe that we have to understand that those talks are vital to America's future when it comes to natural gas. Just a, a, a quick follow up, I guess, to all of you, but specifically to Russia or if you want to say any other country that, that uh, interferes with uh, American elections um, and that what kind of penalties or should there be penalties should the United States government try to affect against uh, those governments? Ms. Smith. Well, I absolutely think there should be penalties and sanctions imposed on Russia and the reluctance of this administration to, to do that um, I think is very disturbing. Um, it's, it's clear, we have clear evidence of Russia's interference in our election, and we know that they're going to do it again in this election cycle as well. So uh, it's imperative, I think, that we get serious about um, having some uh, effective response to that, however we can make it happen. Mr. Trader? Well, I agree with uh, Ms. Methan. I think we need to do a response. We, we need to uh, maybe expel additional diplomats, pull some additional diplomats uh, from Russia. But more importantly, I think we need to stop interacting with Russia like they are our friends, and, and they are not. They are a communistic government. They are not a democracy. They are not our friends. And I think at some point in time, Everything that's happening right now is going to show back up in the next election sooner or later if we don't do something immediately to stop them from interfering in our election. Thank you, Mr. Reader. Mr. Thomas? I think it's imperative that our president show some strength when dealing with Russia by uh, having sanctions and uh, uh, creating more uh, tariffs on products from Russia uh, and China, by the way. But since we're talking about Russia, uh, those sanctions are needed, and we need to separate ourselves from the uh, the, the, micro, the, the the mockery that's going on with this Putin and Trump's administration. We need to separate ourselves. We need to make it clear that America is first, and America needs to concentrate on America products right now, and Thank also you, Mr. Thomas. and also make sure that. Uh, we are striving for a better economy. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. This next question will be asked by Ms. Garrett, and it will go to Mr. Rader. Thank you. Reports are coming in throughout the state of the damaging effects of the Trump tariffs, especially with Louisiana farmers and manufacturing. Lobby says they are waiting, taking a wait-and-see approach. What would you do as a member of Congress to help our Louisiana businesses from being irreparably harmed? 
Well, no, number one, that's a good question. Number one, I don't believe in tariffs. I don't think tariffs work. Tariffs is nothing but another tax passed on to the citizens of the United States. A perfect example is with uh, soybeans uh, and the, uh, the amount of tariffs that's being placed on soybeans. We are losing billions of dollars here in Louisiana uh, because of the tariffs, because of uh, the tax that's being placed on it. But not only, not only is it affecting us here in the 3rd Congressional District, but it's affecting us throughout the United States. So if we're not careful in the direction we're currently heading, taxing American workers, taxing American people, we're going to find ourselves moderately inching towards a recession, a great recession. And that's the way I see it at this point. I don't think tariffs work. I think it's almost a waste of energy and a waste of time. But there is a way to solve the problem that we have with China without getting into tariffs. There's another way. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Um, Louisiana has 1.4 million acres uh, dealing with soybeans. Right now, we're paying a tit. We're playing a tit for tat, back and forth game, trade war between uh, America and China. U.S. hit China with a 34 billion dollar tariff, and China hit America right back. China targets automobiles, crude oil, and cash crops, and America targets aerospace, robotics, manufacturing, and automobile industry. American companies will have to um, take the have to pay for these tariffs either when they come in or have to trade that off to the consumers. So basically, we have to decide how far do we want to go in this tariff war game. It's not a matter of if we're going to get hurt from it. It's a matter of how long do we plan on getting hurt. So we must uh, look at the tariff war and think of how it's going to affect our state in Louisiana when it comes to our agricultural uh, system. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Ms. Methvin? Um, so let me first say that uh, we all know that there are winners and losers in tariff wars, and Louisiana is, I think, um, going to be hit the worst of any other state other than, I think, possibly Texas. And we're hit in a couple of ways. The steel and aluminum tariffs that we have imposed are uh, not only interfering with our ability to uh, build infrastructure and important projects ourselves, but China itself has uh, uh, unveiled projects in Louisiana that it was going to build that are now, uh, you know, maybe uh, off the table because of the tariffs. But as a member of Congress, let me say this. Under the Constitution, members of Congress have the right to, uh, to govern the imposition of tariffs. It only recently has this been transferred uh, to the President. So uh, as a member of Congress, that is one thing that I would push for, is to have some congressional control over, uh, over tariffs in the future so that we can avoid the kind of situation that we're in today. Um, as a follow-up, okay, if tariffs aren't the answer, what is the answer? How do you get countries that are not acting fairly in their international economy to act fairly? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think we can begin by working with our European allies rather than uh, working against them, work with them. Uh, we had a TPP at one time. That was a, a program that was being utilized. And uh, you know what, what China is doing, China is actually taking advantage of the tariffs that's being placed by going to a lot of these other smaller countries. And they are filling in that gap. We are moving out. We are becoming more inward. And China is actually filling that gap that we once held. So if we're not careful, we're going to find ourselves with China leading, especially with intellectual property. And we're going to find the United States slowly taking a back step. Thank you, Mr. Reader. Well, I think our problem is uh, outsourcing uh, when it comes to uh, the different uh, uh, countries such as China right now. And we've got to do something to uh, make America appealing again and bring these corporations back home. So whatever tariffs that are being hit by China, which uh, uh, China uh, tariffs are 500, over 500 billion in America's tariffs is only a hundred billion. So we have to be able to uh, increase our own production and infra infrastructure and manufacturing to actually uh, compensate for what we're losing in this tariff war. 
Thank you, Ms. Thomas. Ms. Metha? So talking about China, clearly China has engaged in unfair policies. One, uh, one of the ways is through uh, requiring American companies to give up their intellectual property uh, uh, trade secrets in order to do business there. The other reason is that China is an authoritarian country. They own um, uh, most of the businesses there, and they are capable of and have been doing currency manipulation. Um, so clearly the answer is we need to do something, but I think impulsive uh, tariffs, which uh, in the long term are going to hurt American businesses, is not the answer. Uh, we do need to fully staff the um, the uh, agencies and the, the uh, diplomatic agencies and trade negotiating agencies that, uh, that do this work. And right now, I understand they have been decimated. Thank you, Ms. Methlin. We're going to turn now to questions about the domestic arena. And to do that, we're going to go back to uh, Mr. McHale. And the first question is directed at Mr. Thomas. Uh, Ms. Thomas, the Republican Party plans to balance the one trillion dollar budget deficit that they created by cutting Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. What would you do to ensure that the promises that we made to seniors and hardworking Americans are kept? Uh, what I would do, um, I would concentrate on, on bringing uh, new ideas to the table for revenue uh, that we're not seeing in our country right now. Uh, right now, we have, a, we have a shortage in infrastructure. Uh, it's determined that by in the next 10 years that we will be a, we have a shortage of 11.5 million in jobs so i believe if we can uh, increase our um our focus on on what on what our infrastructure is going to look like i believe that we'll be able to take care of other uh agencies and other programs such as social security um so that won't affect them right now social security um it's it is it's not in in no jeopardy of, of being uh, unprotected, but right now we need to uh, put focus on making sure that we're not borrowing from this program and we can get it revenue from other places without giving IOUs to Social Security fund. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Ms. Methvin. Um, I, I'd like to remind everyone that the president ran on promises of raising taxes on the rich. Uh, better and cheaper health care for everyone and protecting Social Security and Medicare. Um, and as soon as he was in office, he turned over his domestic agenda to the Republican hierarchy, and they are doing exactly the opposite of what he had promised. Um, so the first thing that, as a member of Congress, that I would fight for is to undo these, you know, this, uh, I think, unfair and untenable um, transfer of wealth to corporations and the wealthy. Um, no one was suffering from this before, and we absolutely have to protect Social, Social Security and Medicare. If, if we were going to blow the budget up with a $1.9 trillion deficit, then we should have, uh, as Mr. Thomas mentioned, invested in infrastructure pro uh, projects or something else that would put the money in the pockets of blue-collar workers or average Americans and not lining the pockets of um, uh, basically corporate investors. Thank you. Mr. Ritter? Sure. That's a good question. You know, a couple of things come to mind when it comes to Social Security and uh, what can we do to shore it up a little bit. And I'm, I'm going to use this number, and I'm not exactly sure if I'm right or wrong, but I think at 114000 or so, you're no longer taxed. So that's something that could be changed where you could add those individuals that's making $114,000 a year. Let them continue to be taxed uh, by Social Security. Uh, we can also increase uh, uh, by 1% uh, the percentage that you pay towards Social Security. By 1%, an employer can also pay 1%. And that will uh, solve the problem that we're having with uh, Social Security. Uh, last but, but not least, um, I, I think, uh, you know, if we look at that 1% at the top, uh, individuals, uh, earners, if we look at that 1% at the top, I think it's, it's fair to say that they're not paying a fair share of taxes. So I think if we collected our fair share from that 1% at the top, the system itself will balance itself out. Okay, thank you. Uh, follow up, Michael. On this one? No. Okay. Uh, moving on to next question, Ms. Garrett. Thank you. Being healthy leads to a better quality of life for all Americans. 
The Affordable Care Act is far from perfect and is under assault right now, right now by the Republican Party. What do you see as the best way to provide quality, cost-efficient health care for all Americans? Ms. Matthew. All right. Well, I favor ultimately a Medicare for all type solution. I believe that every American has the right to quality and affordable health care and that um, if we want a uh, prosperous country, then we need to have a healthy uh, country. We need people who can participate in the economy. Uh, this is the type of long-term investment that, um, that we need for long-term prosperity for the country. It serves everyone, businesses, corporations, uh, and the people. But the bottom line is that um, government needs to um, serve as a balance to um, just outright capitalism. Capitalism is great. It, it generates uh, wonderful wealth. The United States has has uh, uh, done extremely well with the capitalistic system, but government has to be that um, that moderator. And healthcare is one of those things I think most Americans now agree that every American uh, deserves. And so it's complicated. We need to, I think, uh, uh, address right away some of the uh, damage that has been done to the ACA, uh, but eventually try and work toward a Medicare for All. Thank you, Ms. System. Smith. And Mr. Rader. Yes, I also believe in uh, Medicare for All, the Affordable Health Care Act, uh, prior to uh, its existence, most of your hospitals were starting to fail. Individuals would become ill or have a major accident and they would receive the services and the hospitals and institutions would not receive the funding in order for that system to continue working. So the Affordable Health Care Act sort of eliminated that. And it also shored up Medicare and Medicaid to some degree. So when we have a national system, and by the way, we're the only civilized nation in the world that does not have a national health system. We're the only one. So when you look at it from that perspective, it's extremely important that we provide our citizens with a quality of life. You know, life is great, life is good, but what type of quality of life are you actually living? And health care is one of those issues that we must address. And I know as a congressman, if I'm fortunate enough to be a congressman, that's something I will address. Thank you. Mr. Thomas? Um, thanks to the Affordable Care Act, more than 17 million Americans have gained health insurance. And we need a system that allows our people to get the Medicare they need regardless of income, age, and social status. Uh, when we look at Louisiana, per se, uh, we can see the Medicaid expansion and how it's affecting Louisiana right now. Uh, 57,000 people are receiving mental health treatment, 21,000 people receive substance abuse treatment, 400 women are getting treatment for breast care. Uh, I believe Louisiana can be a shining example for what's going on in the medical health care uh, uh, system. Uh, basically, I believe that we need to find, um, find ways to be able to pay for Medicare for All if we do decide to go that way. Right now, it costs $3 trillion, and there are plans on the table that I would support in Congress that only cost a trillion dollars a year to be able to, uh, to sustain a Medicare for All situation. And we can start by getting rid of some of the overseas contingency funds that costs us $160 billion a Thank year. Thank you, Mr. That Thomas. would add up to over 10 years, a trillion dollars. Um, as a follow-up, I'm curious, this is the first time I've heard trillion being used in the context of only a trillion. So that was interesting. <laughs> I, yeah, but we entered a new day. Um, I wanted to the losses that we're taking, $6 trillion that we lose in the Defense Department, I believe a trillion is, uh, okay. is, is getting over pretty easy. My, my question, and I'd like to go back and start with uh, my follow-up, would be to Ms. Methvin, and this would be uh, Medicare for All. How are we going to pay for it? Well, we are already paying for um, health care at, at an amount that is um, over the top, so far above what other countries pay for health care because of the way it's set up. People avoid getting um, health care when they need it. Uh, they wait until they are so sick that they have to go to the emergency room. And that, that those costs are passed on to the American taxpayers. 
Uh, we also pay a tremendous amount so that CEOs of insurance companies can make lots and lots of mm -hmm. money. And um, I think when we um, roll up our sleeves and tackle this, we're going to find that uh, uh, that Medicare for All type system is affordable and can be done. Thank you, Ms. Smithson. Mr. Rader? Well, I, I have a simple solution to that. Tax the 1% at the top. <laughs> Tax the 1%. I mean, they're making the mm -hmm. money and uh, they're receiving all the benefits. They're using all of our infrastructure. They're using everything that the normal taxpayer will actually provide for them. They're using our highways, our airways, and our byways. So as far as I'm concerned, I think we need to tax the 1% at the top, and that should shore up the system. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Uh, like I was saying before, um, right now, U.S. currently spends $3 trillion a year on health care. So if we could have a plan for Medicare for all that only costs one trillion, I believe that would be the idea uh, way we want to go. And I believe we can do that by uh, putting more emphasis on the uh, discretionary spending in our military uh, industrial complex. So if we can stop some of the spending from these wars that, that's unneeded, I believe we can take some of those funds and actually use it to uh, support a Medicare for All scenario. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Next question goes to Mr. McHale and starts with uh, Mr. Rader. The Internet has become a vital resource for conducting business and is a critical part of our everyday lives. Right here in Lafayette, innovative programs such as uh, uh, such as Fiber to the Home has led to business investments and jobs, which is all at risk with the new net neutrality rules by the FCC. Describe your position on net neutrality and what exactly you plan to do as a member of Congress to preserve the Internet as we know it. Well, you know, originally when the Internet uh, started off, it was started off as a means of communications, a quick means of communications, and it was open. It was open. And I think President Obama, uh, he had it, uh, he, he wrote a bill or passed a law where the, uh, the Internet would not, he would not allow the internet service providers to control the internet. And so far, since um, uh, our current administration has come in, uh, it's just the opposite. It's, uh, it's, it's the internet service providers now is open heyday for our consumers. So in actuality, what they can do, they can charge one fee for one set of customers, another fee for another set of customers. They could speed up the internet depending on who's utilizing it, or they can slow it down depending on who's utilizing it. So the disparity is huge because when you're looking at large corporations able to pay the extra money to utilize the Internet, it's just a disservice to the smaller businesses that we want to flourish and grow. Thank you, Mr. Rader. Mr. Thomas? Net neutrality died on June 11th. The new rules gives bigger carriers and Internet service providers uh, more power over what happens uh, online. Basically, we're looking at a monopoly game to see which internet provider reigns as the top dog. In the midst of this battle, you can see data slow down. You can see priority uh, priorities uh, negatively impacted on your subscriptions. Uh, carriers like AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile has the most user data, so they can manipulate and influence that data based on the most with ads and also marketing tools. They could use the ads and marketing tools to be able to manipulate that data, which, which in turn will cost you more in the pocket. So uh, if I was in Congress, I definitely would uh, support any bills or uh, solution that would actually uh, turn back what happened on June 11th. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Ms. Smith. So as a member of Congress, I uh, plan to fight hard to restore net neutrality. Um, it, it, the Internet is a global utility, and um, our economy depends upon it, and our democracy depends upon having um, uh, net neutrality. Um, the records show, I think, that the telecom industry donated $101 million to members of Congress, and I think that was just the last election cycle. A lot of those members, including the incumbent, um, uh, not only voted, uh, well, voted to um, make our 
uh, browsing history available for sale to uh, by ISPs. Uh, that was earlier this year. Um, the um, the FCC rule, uh, the, it's called the, the two, 2015 Open Internet Order that the FCC uh, did away with in June, um, is um, uh, in, the, in the process of doing that, they also divested themselves of power to have any say over net neutrality. So that gives Congress, obviously, uh, the opening to uh, take charge of that issue, and I will definitely fight for net neutrality. Okay, thank you, Arne. Follow up on that. Uh, turning to uh, Ms. Garrett, next question. And this question would go to Mr. Thomas. Our democracy is based on representation, where the people choose who represent, represents them, not the politicians choosing who they want to represent. How do you think our government should address the issue of gerrymandering districts to ensure fair representation before the vital 2020 elections and beyond? Well, I believe that we have to, um, we have to look at different districts and uh, use a computerized, we got to move our technology into place when it comes to gerrymandering and figure out what's the fair um, scenario for uh, each district uh, to have a fair representation of voters compared to, uh, to parties. Right now, our parties, the winning majority, are drawing the lines to give themselves an advantage in the next different the next elections. So we have to be able to look at this in a technical way and by sensor by data censuses and, and look at this uh, data that we that we get from the different censuses and put that together and and come up with some lines that we know favors uh, the people and not the politicians or the parties. Thank you. Ms. Methvin? Um, no, I support taking the responsibility for drawing districts out of the hands of politicians and putting it into the hands of independent commissions that can, um, I think, be more trusted to come up with district lines uh, where um, people do have an equal voice in uh, rep representation. Uh, there are two recent Supreme Court decisions that came out um, that basically remanded the case back to the courts, the local, the state courts, um, to tell them that they that uh, we can't look at um, statewide effects. We can only look at district by district effects. And so those are going back to the courts. Um, that does leave an opening for uh, gerrymandering in these districts to be basically recognized. But um, the fact is, I think we need to take a more uh, long-term and global approach to this by making sure that it's not politicians who decide these questions that are too important for our democracy. Thank you. Mr. Ritter? Sure. Uh, gerrymandering has been around for quite some time. And I, I think um, a federal court recently ruled that gerrymandering, to some degree, is almost unconstitutional. So, so what's the solution? I mean, what do we do in order to make our district lines fair? How can we get fair representations as citizens of this great country? Well, one of the, one of the things that, that we can do is utilize percentages. So in other words, if you've got a 30% minority, then you should have 30% of representation. Uh, anytime you draw a line and you draw a line and, and you only end up with uh, you've got 30% of the population, you only end up with, with one representative within that, within that state, then that's telling you that the system is being flawed, that gerrymandering is actually taking place. So that's one solution, and that's what I would fight for if I become your congressman, is by allowing the population to decide uh, what percentage of uh, individuals we have that serve for us. Um, as a follow-up question on that, um, the many people have accused the Republican Party of voter suppression of passing bills that hurt against people going out and voting, um, of of disempowering the Voting Rights Act in 1965. I was just curious to what extent you thought that uh, Congress needed to take a stronger role in making sure that people are allowed the right to vote and that that vote is not taken away from people who are legitimately able to vote. Uh, well, I believe that voter suppression is a problem. Uh, we saw that in Alabama uh, in, with different cases uh, with uh, 
the amount of time it takes to get to the polling stations and uh, the, the need for IDs, uh, different those type of different situations. So I believe that we have to protect the voters in every way possible, in possible way that we can. So I believe that we need to make sure that uh, that that they're educated on um, on on the issues and and where the polling stations are and what is needed. We need to come to some type of uh, concrete um, uh, realization of what actually is happening uh, with voters and, and, and what their needs are to actually get to the polls and have a fair voting opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Ms. Methvin? Um, I do believe that there needs to be uh, uh, national legislation to address this. This is a critical problem in our uh, electoral system. I have not looked up to see what what bills may be pending right now, but nationally, I mean, we're seeing voter ro rolls being purged. We're seeing lots and lots of ID laws, new ID laws, which we know disproportionately affect minority communities. Um, and our entire criminal justice system, I have to say, that, that that has an effect on our voter system as well. You know, I was glad that Louisiana now has passed uh, a law that allows uh, ex-felons, after they have finished all probation and uh, parole, that they are, can now re-register to vote. That's at least one step in the right direction. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Ritter? Sure. One of the things I think we can do in order to strengthen our uh, voting rights is to assure that individuals that can vote is allowed to vote. In a lot of situations, especially in the minority community, people have not seen results from voting. So a lot of, a lot of minorities are no longer going to the polls and vote because uh, they, they don't understand what's the advantages for them. So if we could make our, our community comprehend and understand the advantages that you have in voting, and at the same time, protect that right, enforce those laws, and, uh, and pass a, a national law to, to, to eliminate uh, vote tampering, totally eliminate it. And uh, only then, I think, will uh, America truly be what she's, uh, what she's uh, li lived up to be. Thank you. Next question goes to uh, Mr. McHale. Uh, with the recent resignation of Scott Pruitt and the interim head of the Environmental Protection Agency being a coal lobbyist, what do you envision as the role of the EPA in protecting the environment and regulating business? For me? Um, before, uh, or before I became a U.S. Magistrate Judge, I worked for the Department of Interior in an environmental program, and the head of that program was James Watt. It was exactly the same scenario. He was extremely hostile to the programs, the environmental programs of the Department of Interior. Um, we've got the same situation now with uh, a, 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 a coal lobbyist in charge of regulations to uh, protect our air and water. Um, I think this is one of the reasons that um, many people get discouraged with, with, uh, with their government and don't show up for the polls. I think we absolutely need to have a mechanism where um, people put in charge of the executive branches that they run uh, have to be committed to the programs that they are supposed to be overseeing. Um, our environment is too important. Uh, to have a hostile or corporate-owned person at the helm. Okay, Mr. Ritter. Sure. Uh, you know, as we uh, as we move forward in, in life, large companies are slowly coming in and they are taking over a lot of land that was once land that people actually lived on. I'll give you a, give you a perfect example in the, in the Atchafalaya Basin. Uh, there's a pipeline that's uh, running through that basin. And uh, from what I can understand, most of the people that live in the basin didn't want the pipeline in the basin. Uh, the company came through and they started uh, grinding uh, some of these big trees that have been living for years, for hundreds of years. They start just total devastation uh, in that area. So, you know, when you look at an uh, individual's lifestyle, when you look at people and their lifestyle and what they choose, the way they choose to live, and you look at a company, who's got the right, who owns that land, and who's got the right to say, your lifestyle is gonna change for dollars. And so we, we need to look at these large corporations and we need to stand up to them. And we need to have the right judges in place that'll say no to them and no means no, you can't do it. Thank you, Mr. Reader, Mr. Thomas. 
Well, I believe that um, the environment is one of the most important things um, on the table today, especially in Louisiana with our culture erosion and different aspects of uh, how Louisiana is affected by climate change. And I believe that uh, having a president and the EPA director that don't believe in climate change and took us out of the Paris Agreement was very detrimental to this country and our state. So I believe that we have to reverse what's going on in, in, in our government and bring some solutions to the table that's going to attack climate change. Because right now, Louisiana is losing 80% of its coast 80% of the coast erosion in, in America is in Louisiana, is what I mean. Um, so we have to bring solutions to the table. Louisiana is like a, a little, the Gulf is like a little fishbowl with all this water pouring in, and that's why we're seeing flooding and different devastations to our coast. So we must support uh, any uh, moves that's going to take us to uh, making a stronger environment uh, in Louisiana. Just a, a, a quick follow-up. Uh, particularly with Southwest Louisiana being a big hub for oil and gas, and, and again, you mentioned the coastal erosion uh, problem that we have here in Louisiana. Do you believe the federal government should have a uh, bigger role in not only repairing the coastal erosion, but also in holding the companies that have caused the coastal erosion accountable? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, the idea that the federal government should take solely the, own, the whole burden of um, helping to fund our coastal master plan, I, I think is wrong because the oil and gas industry, and sometimes with the help of um, uh, Louisiana agencies, uh, they were allowed to uh, do a lot of damage to our coast. Uh, they were allowed to get away with it, even though their permits required them to reclaim the land. Um, I think the oil and gas industry, Louisiana has stood with them. They need to stand with us. And I think that they should settle the coastal lawsuits that are pending now uh, as a sign of good faith and the fact that they're, they're standing with us after we have stood with them for so long. Thank you, Ms. Smith. And Mr. Rader? Yeah, I agree. I think the federal government, uh, to some degree, uh, should play a role and making sure that uh, not only Louisiana coastline is uh, is shored up, but uh, throughout the South, wherever there is oil, wherever the oil industry has thrived, and and the state the state holds uh, uh, they should be held accountable as well. Uh, the state has actually uh, they were the ones that gave the permits to these oil companies to go in on some lands and do what they did, uh, and to some degree even the landowner should be held accountable. So n no one should just get off the hook here when it comes to our environment and doing damage to our environment. Everyone should play a role. The landowner Thank received uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Thank so. you, Mr. 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 I Mr. agree Thomas. that the uh, federal government should play a role. I believe that right now uh, the bureaucrats in Washington are lacing their pockets with oil and gas money, and I believe that the oil and gas industry in Louisiana should take the dwindling profits that we're seeing uh, from the oil and gas industry and invest that into renewable fuels. Renewable fuels is the future. So if we look at uh, solar, magnetic force, and wind, we can basically take uh, oil and gas industry out of the scenario and, and at the same time because they're the one that's investing in renewable fuels. It could be a win-win situation for everybody because the object is not losing revenue. And if we can show them a way that they can keep their revenue and invest in renewable fuels, then it's a win-win situation for all of us. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Ms. Garrett, can I ask the next question? Yes. This is an education question. Betsy DeVos has shown little regard for America's students and teachers, from stripping students' rights to not supporting teachers in the classroom. What would you do to ensure that America's education system truly leaves no child behind? Mr. Ritter. Hmm. That's a good question. <laughs> no child's left behind, and it's, no child should be left behind. Uh, we need to invest more in education. We need to put more of our tax dollars in education, and at the same time, each state need to be responsible to assure that children are taught at a very, very young age. Those individuals that are having problems in school shouldn't be put out of school, but should be placed in special schools where they can learn. We need to have more teachers in school, and we need to pay our teachers an adequate salary. I think more than anything else, teachers are underpaid. They should be paid more 
for what they do. They are professionals, and they should be treated as such. Mr. Thomas? Education is known as the one factor that makes everyone similar. The combination of a good education and hard work is the recipe for success. Um, but there's a few things that affect this equation. The complexity of the family structure, challenges with making enough income to support a family, and also poverty. Poverty affects uh, our system a lot when it comes to education and also sends uh, a lot of uh, our citizens to the prison system. So if we can figure out how to put more emphasis on education uh, when it comes to technology, when it comes to uh, giving our teachers more pay and supporting our administrators and our principals with the, the tools that they need to be able to uh, effectively uh, create a system that works for our kids. Louisiana's number 50 right now. We can do everything possible to bring our education system up and also that would help us uh, uh, do, uh, the numbers in poverty dwind, uh, from dwindling. Thank to you. Dwindling. Ms. Betha? So just uh, pivoting off what uh, Mr. Thomas said, we are uh, number one, or recently were number one in incarceration and number 50 in education in Louisiana. And um, I think it's absolutely critical that uh, we understand that there is a connection there. I don't want to talk too much about criminal justice reform, but there, there, is, uh, there are many studies that, um, that talk about um, how important early childhood education is, where we're spending millions and millions caging people instead of investing in education. Uh, talking about it from a national perspective, uh, we have got to resist the idea that privatization is the answer to everything. Um, the push, uh, Betsy DeVos is heavily invested in a lot of um, companies that are trying to sell services or to take over parts of public education, and I think that's absolutely the wrong uh, direction. Public education, if we don't invest in it as a nation, we're going to fall behind uh, other countries, wealthy countries and civilized countries in the world. Thank you. We are now going to turn to issues on local and state politics, and the first question goes to Mr. McHale. With the recent failures of the Veterans Administration and the increase in suicide rates for veterans, how do you envision the VA providing adequate and expedient services to those who have sacrificed so much for their country? Mr. Thomas? Uh, we have to look at uh, different programs that uh, helps the VA, such as CHOICE. Uh, also, um, we have to make sure that we have the right staff in place to be able to make sure the VA is working in an efficient way. Uh, when veterans come out of the military, I believe that they are 20 years uh, ahead of the, the civilian world when it comes to training in certain areas and technology. So I believe that we have to educate also the public on how to accept the veterans when they come home. Uh, I just talked with uh, the mayor a couple of weeks ago in Lake Charles about having a program where, um, where we can actually have job fairs for the different uh, veterans and the different job placements for veterans, just specifically for veterans, and also charge programs where they're able to be able to choose the hospitals that they want to go to, and also uh, the care for uh, home care. It's, you know, we should be able to support home care no matter if it's a family member or not. So different things that we can do to actually help the VA be stronger. And, and I, as a congressman, I plan on uh, putting some of those policies on the table and solutions on the table to help our veterans uh, Thank you, Mr. Thomas. in a positive way. Ms. Matheson? Um, as an assistant U.S. attorney, my first job uh, on the civil section was defending VA doctors, and I spent a lot of time at the VA hospital and talking to the doctors there. Um, you know, we have heroes that are working in the system and trying to make it better, uh, but unfortunately, I don't think in Congress there is a priority there. I was just listening to a, a program today that was uh, a, a member of Congress talking about the fact that Veterans Affairs Committee, the Veterans Affairs Committee is considered a C committee, meaning it has one of the lowest priorities in Congress. We've got to uh, uh, commit to taking care of our veterans. I think it's a critical 
uh, thing, and it defines us as a country, what we, what we actually value. So um, I don't have any easy answers, but I am committed to, uh, if I go to Washington, I'm going to roll up my sleeves and fight uh, hard to get a, a solution to, I think, what we're seeing today. Thank you. Mr. Ritter? Okay. As a veteran myself, I, I understand the challenges that uh, veterans face, uh, especially when they return home and uh, especially when they've been involved in, in combat type situations. Uh, there, there's a scenario that's happening right now in Congress where individuals that served uh, during the time that I served, which is back in the 70s during the Vietnam era, uh, Agent Orange was, was, were, was utilized on, on bases in Thailand and in Laos and Cambodia, and those individuals that served on those bases are not being treated like the veterans are being treated uh, that served in uh, Vietnam, although they, they have the exposure. So th there, and there are a lot of veterans that served in Thailand that, that, that received the Vietnam Service Medal, and, uh, but they're, they're not receiving the same uh, entitlement as those other individuals that actually uh, served in Vietnam. So I think we need to, uh, America needs to uh, live up to her promise. If you serve in the military, you did your job, you should receive uh, what you're just doing. Thank you, Mr. Reader. Um, as a follow-up, I'm curious, and this would go to uh, Mr. Thomas' first question. Uh, there's been an epidemic of suicides and drug addiction, and, and we've heard all about homeless vets and so on. Uh, it, does a task force need to be convened nationally? Do we need to get serious about that? What, what would you do if you were in Congress? Yes, I think a task force uh, would help the situation out when it comes to suicide. Like I said, there's a lot of depression uh, when dealing with veterans because uh, it's hard to, to place uh, the training that they have into the civilian world when they come home. So it's a matter of getting the citizens and the, and the veterans on one uh, uh, level, on the same level, so the citizens and, the, and America can understand the mind of the veteran when he comes home. Uh, it's not that they're 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 behind. It's most of the times they're overqualified and they're ahead. So I believe that we need to have a task force to be able to to bridge the gap between what's uh, uh, the mind of the veteran and the mind of the country. Thank you, Ms. Methvin. Um, I would support uh, a task force, but I would all also observe that you know what we're seeing in the country is uh, you know the, with the opioid epidemic, uh, the the number of deaths and suicides in gen general. You know, our economy is working great for the 1% and for corporations. Uh, there's a big boom right now in the economy, so they say, but um, if you ask people, uh, basically, people are struggling, especially people in the third district. Uh, people are working full time, sometimes two jobs, and still living in poverty. Um, the, you know, there's a lot of hopelessness that's going on. It's not just limited to veterans. And this is why we need to turn things around. We need to make government policies work for real people. We need people to be hopeful and productive and to participate in the economy. And I think we'll see, uh, you know, some of this uh, tragic news um, abating. Hopefully. Thank you, Ms. Methvin. Ms. Trader? Well, you know, most of your mental health facilities uh, in the state of Louisiana are actually closing or have closed. So uh, as a congressman, I would fund more mental health facilities. And not only for veterans, but all, for all individuals that are, uh, are placed with what I call the fat elephant in the room, which is mental health problems. You know, uh, currently, the, the situation now is if an individual is faced with a mental health issue, uh, he's actually or she's actually going to spend more time in jail than receiving the mental health that they actually need in order to solve some of the problems that they are having. Thank you. This next question is going to be asked by Ms. Garrett, and it goes to Ms. Methvin. Louisiana pays women 67 cents on the dollar compared to their male counterparts, and women of color make less than 49 cents. With the legislature's inabil inability to pass equal pay legislation, what would you do on a federal level to ensure that Louisiana women, regardless of race, get equal pay for equal work? Well, uh, again, I don't have a specific answer to that other than the fact that I am absolutely committed to seeing uh, this, this change. Um, you know, we've had the Me Too mo uh, movement that's started, and 
women are not second-class citizens. So we're tired of being uh, told we're second-class citizens by having policies made for us, uh, by um, committees that are made up all of men. Um, we need more women in Congress. We need uh, to speak out more about the inequality that we are experiencing. Um, and again, you know, policies that are made in Washington can affect day-to-day uh, -day life for folks uh, here in Louisiana. Uh, it's a shame that we did not have that legislation passed, but we just have to keep fighting uh, for equity and pay uh, for women, as well as many other issues that uh, disproportionately affect women, like affordable childcare. Uh, that is uh, huge uh, for, for women to be able to um, actually support themselves and, and get to work. Thank you. Mr. Ritter? You know, some women are working two jobs in order to make ends meet. It's so unfortunate that uh, my daughter, and I have two daughters, can actually be one of those individuals that's having to work two jobs in order to make ends meet, especially single parents. And it's, it's reached a point now, I think, where uh, a lot of women are saying, basically, listen, I've got the education. Uh, I can do the work. Why am I not receiving the pay? So if I was your congressman, I, I would do everything in my power to assure that women are treated equally and they are treated fairly and they are treated justly. And not only women, but minorities, all minorities. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Uh, if I was elected to Congress, I would first uh, support the Paycheck uh, Fairness Act that's already on the table. Uh, in Washington, I would definitely support that act because I believe women are um, are strong. They're uh, they've, they've become the backbone of our society in so many ways. Uh, Ninety-one percent of the household decisions that are made are made by women right after they graduate from high school. So I believe to close the gap for uh, for for pay for women is would be a priority. Uh, in my administration in Congress. I believe that that uh, just up in the minimum wage would also help women in so many different ways because women are uh, the majority when it comes to uh, different occupations dealing with uh, with, with fast foods. Uh, also women women are thriving in, in different occupations when it comes to our uh, in a society such as uh, um, the workforce. Uh, uh, Thank you, Mr. Thomas. <laughs> I do have a follow up. Um, outside of upping the minimum wage, as you say, Mr. Thomas, w what other what other policies would you ensure that women actually um, are receiving equal pay? H how would you police those types of things? This would go to Ms. Metzen first. Well, I think pay transparency would be a big um, a big uh, important policy so that women can actually find out. And there's a lot of a uh, lot of jobs that we have where it's actually against uh, the rules of the company to even make ask a question about how much other people are making that are working exactly the same job and exactly the same hours. Um, there is no real I think r responsible reason or persuasive reason for uh, people not to be able to have this information and once there's sunshine on it we're going to do something we can do something about it. Thank you Mr. Ray. Well, I, I think a uh, whole company is responsible. I think uh, if a company is found to, to be uh, treating someone uh, different, uh, a woman or, an, or a minority or any individual, regardless, I think they should be held accountable. I think there should be fines placed on a company, and uh, I think that would solve a lot of our problems, especially if we started uh, finding those companies that are not being fair and, and equitable to uh, all individuals that's that's employed. Mr. Thomas? I would have to agree. We would have to um, make sure that the policies that we create in Washington would actually uh, uh, make it a uh, uh, a make it a make a fine for companies that do uh, discriminate against women. I believe that women you know have has grown to a um, a level in our economy that we have to respect them in the same way that we respect everyone else, uh, especially in Louisiana where women are uh, paid less than anywhere else in the whole country. Thank you. Uh, next question goes to uh, Mr. McHale and it will be directed to Mr. Rader. 
With Governor Edwards expanding Medicaid in the state, we brought 19,000 new jobs and over $1.5 billion in direct economic impact to the state. Do you support Medicaid expansion? And if so, how would you protect it on the federal level? Well, I do support it. I do support it. I think it's helped us tremendously to, uh, to sort of shore up our finances here in the state of Louisiana. Now, um, by the same token, I think we can do some things on a state level ourselves. And, and I'm going to go back to what I said in my opening statement. By diversifying our economy and creating more jobs and creating more opportunities, putting more people to work, getting more people paying taxes rather than being on a system where they're utilizing our taxes. So as far as Washington is concerned, I would, I would write a bill to assure that uh, Louisiana continue to receive those funds. Uh, I think it's vital for Louisiana to get their fair share of that tax dollars that's being sent to the federal government. So I would write a bill to support that. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. When Louisiana expanded its Medicaid health care programs two years ago, no one knew how big of an impact that would make on Louisiana. And thanks to John Bell Edwards' tireless work on this issue, 477,000 people has enrolled uh, in Medicaid. The historical shift is, is, extra, is, is enormous. Uh, it makes communities safer, workers are healthier and more productive. Emergency rooms are not filled with people there just for uh, minor illnesses such as colds. Parents can rest a little easier knowing that their family, their families are healthier. Uh, it deals with fragile children, families with, dis with disabilities, and uh, also adults with disabilities. So I believe that Louisiana can be uh, the blueprint for uh, what could happen in a Medicare for all situation because I believe that we're seeing how the Medicaid program that John Bell Edwards uh, established is actually helping the Medicare system in an extra extraordinary way. Thank you. Ms. Methvin? And I would echo that as well. Uh, Medicaid expansion has a huge positive impact on uh, on Louisiana, and it's hard to even think about the years where um, so many people in Louisiana did not have any access to health care at all. Um, I don't, for the life of me, don't understand uh, the reasoning for uh, some of these policies, but uh, fortunately, uh, Governor Edwards took the right step, and it's been great for the state in many ways, including many, many jobs that have been um, uh, created. Um, every other wealthy country um, has figured out a way to get health care to all of its people, and they understand the benefits of that. So whether it's Medicaid expansion or uh, Medicare for all or some other system, I think the United States, um, we've lagged behind. It's time for us to catch up and to invest in the health of our, uh, of our people for the benefit of uh, everyone, including uh, uh, corporations and businesses, big and small. Thank you. As a follow-up, uh, there's been a lot of talk about <clears throat> work requirements with Medicaid, and I was just wondering, do you think uh, in order to get uh, greater cohesion in the Medicaid program and account for, make sure that people aren't using the program in a way that you should institute work requirements? What do you think this would be, Mr. Radar? Yeah, well, um, I think we, I would work on fraud first. I would look at the system and start off with fraud and make sure that uh, there's, there's not a whole lot of fraud within the system, which I'm sure there is. Also look at uh, what we're paying for prescription drugs. That's another area I would like to look at as a congressman to sort of level that out a little bit. Now, to answer your question as far as uh, actually getting individuals to work, and then on Medicaid, I, I don't approve of that because uh, I thought the whole thing was them uh, going on Medicaid because they can't work. Now, if they can work and they're on Medicaid, then they shouldn't be on Medicaid. Uh, but, uh, you know, in some situations, in some rare situations, I think uh, individuals may be able to find some work that they can do, maybe on a part-time basis or something like Thank that. Thank you, Mr. Ritter. Mr. Thomas? Well, I believe the Medicaid program is misunderstood in a lot of different ways. I mean, Medicaid is there to help, uh, uh, let's say, college students, college students that uh, can't afford uh, medical care, uh, 
also is there to help uh, people with disabilities that, that's uh, su suffering with poverty. You know, so there's different ways uh, we, l we can look at Medicaid and, um, and, and try to understand how we can make the system better. But we have to also put systems and checks and balances in place to be able to, to check to make sure that um, the right, uh, that the system is not being abused in any kind of way. Thank you, Ms. Methvin. Work requirements for Medi Medicaid? Yeah, um, yeah, I think this is uh, based again on this us and them mentality that is great for politics, uh, creating uh, resentment among different segments of, uh, of our society. Um, there, there is a lots of Medicaid fraud, but it's not on the part of people who are actually seeking medical care. It's on the part of, there's a lot of providers that are uh, involved in Medicaid fraud, and I presided over a lot of those cases in federal court. But the idea that um, people are fraudulently seeking health care is just absolutely wrong. That doesn't happen. Uh, people get health care when they're sick. And I also uh, understand that the cost of administering a system to enforce work requirements is so overly burdensome that it's Im impossible to actually fund that. We need to put that money into health care itself. Thank you, Ms. Methvin. We move on to the next question asked by Ms. Garrett. Thank you. Louisiana is unique because we are on the convergence of energy and the environment. How would you protect both the environment and ensure that Louisiana remains a dominant force in energy production? This goes to Mr. Thomas. Uh, well, I'm, I'm a believer in the future. I'm a believer in technology. And I believe that we have to bring uh, new technology in to keep uh, Louisiana afloat in some diff different ways. Uh, we have to get rid of, well, look at it like this. Our transportation system is one of the biggest assets that we have. We're number one in exporting. So I believe that we have to get rid of our old rail system and bring in a system like the Hyperloop, which goes 750 miles an hour. It's a capsule that passes through a tube. And if we put a port in Lake Charles, Lafayette, Baton Rouge, and New Orleans, uh, I believe that I access to the Gulf and, and bringing uh, people, material, and product back at mock speed would actually be a beneficiary to uh, a benefit to our state, a uh, billion dollars uh, within uh, a matter of a couple of years. So it only take two billions to build the Hyperloop, and I believe that we can also we can see uh, the profits from that within a two-year margin. So I believe in bringing technology back uh, to you know, to to uh, Louisiana. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Smith. All right, so Louisiana has been a leader in uh, energy for, for many years. And so we're in a perfect position to uh, take a leadership role in the future, which is renewable energy. Um, we had a lot of energy professionals here. Uh, this is the wave of the future. Louisiana needs to be um, ready to move into that area. We also know that uh, fossil fuel companies are investing heavily in renewables as well. So while a lot of people in Louisiana are hopeful that some of our oil and gas jobs will come back, um, automation and technology basically means that's not, not really going to happen. So I think Louisiana uh, needs to pivot and embrace what is the wave of the future and be a leader uh, in that wave of the future. Uh, at the same time, um, it's going to help our environment as well to, uh, to be on the leading edge uh, and again, I call on our fossil fuel industry, the oil and gas companies that have been involved in the coastal damage to uh, step up and be a partner in helping us uh, restore our coast. Thank you, Mr. Ritter. Yes, I agree. Uh, clean energy, green energy is the solution. Uh, our environment here is the only one we have. And once we mess this up, I think we're all going to suffer. Who would have known 20 years ago that we will actually be buying water out of a bottle. Unbelievable. By the same token, Coca-Cola came in a can. It was, uh, you could purchase it in a can at one time. And then you could purchase it in a bottle prior to that. And then in a plastic bottle now. So transformation is just a part of, of uh, the way we do business uh, in the United States and throughout our country. So transforming our environment and transforming our economy to a green e economy is, is just the next step in evolution as far as I'm concerned. I think we can kill more than one bird with one stone by putting solar panels on the top of elderly people's homes. I think it will not only create jobs at the same time, 
but also help to save our environment as well. Just a, a quick follow-up to, to that question. Particularly in southwest Louisiana, where oil and gas has played such a big part in our economy, um, over the years that we've been told that damage to the environment is just kind of the cost of doing business and that we would have to make a choice between either having good jobs or a clean environment. Um, do, you fair, do you feel that that's a, a fair choice or is, is that a uh, false narrative that, that, that's been given to the, the people? Mr. Thomas? Well, I think that, um, that we're behind in that scenario. I believe that we should have been uh, switched from oil and gas industry to the renewable fuels. The rest of the world has already given us the forecast on what's coming with climate change, and Louisiana is actually being affected the most out of all the states because of our because of our situation, our location on the Gulf. So, I believe we should we are in a cold red situation, and we need to move up our efforts to move towards green energy and renewable fuels. So I believe that the oil and gas industry should, should invest more into renewables, and also we have to also u uh, utilize our uh, our agricultural uh, benefits uh, that that comes into play for Louisiana also. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Uh, Ms. Smith. All right, so if you look at the, the coast of Louisiana, uh, the oil and gas canals that have been basically ribboned uh, through southwest Louisiana, um, has they, that's caused a tremendous saltwater intrusion and that's caused the loss of a lot of our coastland and our marshes. So when those permits were given out, uh, there was a requirement that the land be reclaimed once it was done. Uh, the corporations built into that their cost of doing business. That was in the permit itself. So I do think it's a, a, a false narrative to say that we have to give up um, our environmental rights in order to have the corporations uh, do what they had contracted to do in the first place. Thank you, Mr. Ritter. Well, I think at the time that that statement was originally made, there may have been some truth to it. But uh, currently, where we are now in history, I think we're at a crossroads. And I think uh, the time is now for us to make that transformation. Uh, a lot of your oil and gas companies are making that trans uh, transformation. I think uh, there's a company that just opened up and placed some solar panels in, uh, in the Baton Rouge area. And so that transformation is happening. I would like to see it happen a little different. I would like to see residences where you're not having to worry about that electric bill every month. So I would like to see taking it away from the big power companies and giving that money back to you so we could stimulate our environment, stimulate our economy here in Louisiana Thank you, and Mr. clean Mayor. our environment. Okay, uh, next question is going to be asked by uh, Mr. McHale, and it goes to Ms. Methvin. Um, Louisiana does not have a state minimum wage. The cost of living across the state varies from New Orleans to Lake Charles. What do you think is a fair, livable wage in southwest Louisiana? What would you do on the federal level to ensure that Louisiana residents get that long-awaited raise? I am a full supporter of a $15 minimum wage. I think that um, if we value uh, people and we uh, value social justice, if we want a long-term, um, profitable, prosperous country, that we will pay people uh, a living wage for their work. There's no reason why in the United States people working full-time should live in poverty, not be able to afford food, not be able to afford housing. I think uh, the last article I read about it said that there are only 22 counties, counties in the country where someone working uh, a minimum wage job can afford a two-bedroom apartment uh, or, a, yeah, a two-bedroom, uh, no, a one-bedroom apartment. No place in the United States can you uh, afford a two-bedroom apartment on minimum wage. So I think for Louisiana, as well as every other place in the nation, we should have that as the base minimum. Um, and I'm quite sure that we can find ways to make this doable for small businesses, especially if we uh, have a Medicaid, a Medicare for all system Thank so you, that Ms. small Benson. businesses don't have to uh, bear that burden as well. Thank you, Mr. Ritter. Yeah, uh, I think 17 bucks is a fair amount. When, when you look at, uh, when, you, when you multiply that time, you know, 40 hours, it's a fair amount looking at our cost of living here in Louisiana. 
uh, a lot of uh, a lot of single women, a lot of single parents are working two jobs in order to make ends meet. And when you look at those two jobs at like eight bucks an hour, that comes up to like 16, 17 bucks an hour. So what I would do, I would I would be willing to write a bill that would, would, would mandate that Louisiana, the federal minimum wage is 17 bucks an hour. Now, I mean, I get 17 because it's not just left up to me, but uh, certainly I would, I would maybe go 20 and they might drop it down to 17. Who knows? <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Thomas. I also support um, $15 an hour. I believe uh, that the bill uh, to increase the minimum wage fell last May because of uh, businesses uh, that were afraid that um, that they would be able to thrive uh, from paying their uh, employees a little bit more money. But I believe that if we actually pay our workers a little bit more money, that they would invest more money in our economy and spend more, and we would see more uh, um, uh, businesses thrive because of of the money that's being spent in our economy. So I do uh, uh, believe that fifteen dollars an hour would actually help. Louisiana out in a lot of different ways. I've seen it in California when they raised the minimum wage in California, and and now I can see that being the same thing of helping Louisiana out of the uh, deficits and the problems that we're having with revenue in Louisiana. So I do support fifteen dollars an hour. We're coming to the end of our program. Uh, I think we'd like to get that last question in, but we'll just do maybe uh, forty-five seconds on each of the last questions with no follow-up. This we go to Ms. Garrett. Lafayette has a citywide public fiber optic system which came online in 2009 after residents passed it overwhelmingly. In today's digital age, everyone from students to businesses need high-speed internet. What would you do as a member of Congress to help improve internet access across the district and Louisiana as a whole? Mr. Ritter. Well, you know, when, when we talk about high-speed internet and the advantages, especially in some of your minority communities that, that can't afford it, I think it should actually be uh, allocated based upon that household's income. To, to When we talk about educating America, to assure that those individuals in that household, has, they have equal access. Uh, when you're looking at 60, 70, 80 bucks an hour for internet access, a lot of times uh, a poor family can't afford that, so they don't have any internet access at all. So what they end up doing is going to some hot spots in order to uh, to get the internet. A lot of times Mr. that's not feasible. Thank you. I believe uh, that's where net neutrality comes back into play and I believe that um, we have to um, do away with um, uh, and uh, well, support net neutrality and at the same time we need to bring more broadband to Louisiana and to um, um, Lafayette and that way the different um, Households will be able to actually utilize the internet uh, in the way that it was intended to be utilized. Uh, it was intended to be free use, and uh, and right now to monopolize the market and to determine which uh, households have uh, the access to internet and not. I don't believe it's it's, it's a good way, approach to take right now. Thank you. And lastly, Ms. Smith. Uh, I, I, I will just say, uh, reaffirm what the value is, and the value is that if we're going to compete globally, um, we need to make sure that Internet access is as widely available as possible, uh, starting with schools and, uh, and, and homes as well. It, this is now uh, it's sort of like electricity. We expect everybody to be able to uh, live with electricity in the United States. The Internet uh, is that important for education, for information, um, and for prosperity. So whether it's through grants or other federal initiatives, um, I would fully support that. Just go to Washington and be dedicated to that value and uh, find ways to make it work. Well, we've reached the end of the formal question part of our program. What we'd like to do now is allow you to say once again to voters why they should consider you for this position, and we'll do that as we did with the intros. And But we'll start with reverse order. You have a minute each, and we'll start with you, Mr. Thomas. Once again, my name is Verone Thomas. I'm running for uh, the Congressional Office for Louisiana 3rd Congressional District. Uh, I'm running for Congress because I believe we're in a cold red situation. 
our country is suffering, our state is suffering from different policies that are not working for the average American. And right now, we need support with, uh, for other congressmen that's in Washington, and we need to be able to uh, uh, cross the aisles and, and also uh, get rid of some of our polarization that we see in Congress and work together to be able to come up with policies and bills that would directly uplift America and our state out of the abyss that we're in. We can't afford to keep seeing uh, our, our country uh, dwindle because of coast erosion, because of, of uh, climate change, and our infrastructures are crumbling. We need to be able to, uh, uh, to be able to get together and come up with the funds and revenue that we can that we need to be able to come up with to actually solve the problems with uh, the revenue that we're finding short of in our country right now. Thank so you. So please vote for Ron Thomas. Stand with the big man, 2018. Thank you, Mr. Ritter. Uh, once again, thank you. I would like to. Uh, uh, give my thanks to the Democratic Party for allowing up me to be here this afternoon, as well as Acadiana Open Channel for airing this, uh, this segment, as well as those uh, in the uh, listening audience. Uh, once again, my name is Larry Rader, and I'm a candidate for the 3rd Congressional District for Congress. Uh, you know, as I travel throughout the district, some of the things I see throughout your smaller communities, from Morgan City all the way to Opelousas, from Henderson all the way up towards Lake Charles, I see a lot of cities not really receiving their just due as far as tax collections are concerned. As a member of the Port of Iberia, as a commissioner, I see what's happening with our oil industry. I understand what's, what's, what's making us lose our value, what's making us lose our standards that we once had here in southwest Louisiana. We need to regain that back. We need to, we need to make sure that we don't lose our culture. And in order to do that, we're going to have to diversify our economy. And, and it's not a hard thing to do. We've, we've done it before, and we can do it again. Uh, as your next congressman, I will stand firm in making sure that that happens. And we can do it with clean, green energy, protecting our environment, and also providing energy to our, our senior citizens. Thank you, Mr. Rader. Ms. Bethman? Thank you. Thank you all for having me. Um, I've never run for a political office before. This is my first time. Um, I've had experience in all three branches of the government. I've been a judge on both federal and state courts. But there are two things that are happening right now or th that are problems in Washington. One is partisan politics, and the other is the corrupting influence of money in politics. Um, on the issue of partisan politics, um, I am a professional mediator. That was one of the things that I enjoyed the most as a, a judge for 26 years is settling lawsuits. So I will talk to Democrats, I will talk to Republicans, I'll talk to independents, um, whatever it takes um, to have a conversation and to get the country moving forward. And the other thing, uh, the, the corrupting money uh, in politics, I have pledged not to take uh, money from corporations or um, from uh, lobbyists, I, I believe that we need people with vision and skill and political will to go to Washington and fight for the people of the 3rd District. So my name is Mimi Methvin, and I look forward to seeing folks on the campaign trail. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of the Louisiana Democratic Party, AOC Media, our questioners today, Mr. Michael McHale and Ms. Kelly Garrett, and our candidates, we certainly thank you for listening and appreciate all the input and everything you're doing for to make our democracy great again. We'd like to remind you that at 7 o'clock we are going to have another uh, forum, and that is going to be concerning a 4th District congressional candidate. So we invite you to stay tuned for that. Thanks so much for tuning in tonight.
Good evening. On behalf of the Louisiana Democratic Party and AOC Media, we'd like to welcome you to this 4th Congressional District Forum. The Louisiana Democratic Party has fielded a great candidate for this election cycle, and we wanted to provide you this opportunity for you to hear from him directly. I'm Michael McHale, Vice Chair of the Louisiana Democratic Party, and I'm joined by Ms. Kelly Garrett, who's the Vice President of Blue Acadiana. Um, our candidate tonight is Mr. Ryan Trundle. Um, we're going to give Ryan uh, about a minute and a half to kind of introduce himself, and then we're going to ask him some questions that have been provided to us uh, through, uh, through people on the Internet and through the staff of the Louisiana Democratic Party. And uh, this hopefully will be an informative night for everybody, uh, informative and entertaining night. Um, with that, uh, Ms. Trundle. Yes, let's hope it's entertaining. <laughs> Hi. Um, let's see here. So I'm from Shreveport. I've been an uh, activist, community organizer my entire life, uh, since I was nine, actually. And never thought about being in politics until a couple of years ago when I was a delegate for Bernie Sanders. Um, but with what I've seen going on, uh, lately with the $1.4 trillion uh, gift to the wealthy that, uh, you know, left the uh, working class and the poor behind, uh, cuts to Social Security, where senior citizens are having to choose between food and prescriptions, um, and uh, one million veterans just kicked off of food stamps. Uh, I, I could not stand by and, and let this happen, so... With uh, encouragement from the community, the community uh, I decided to run, and uh, hopefully we can make a Congress that uh, works for everyone and not just the 1%, which is also why I'm not taking any corporate money or working with super PACs. It's all uh, grassroots, small donation campaign. Great. Um, we're going to start out uh, first with a couple of questions about international matters, then we're going to switch to domestic matters, and then some local and state issues. Mm -hmm. um, first, uh, as far as the international question, uh, United States Senator John Kennedy just spent the Fourth of July holiday in Russia. On Russian state TV, presenters and guests mocked the U.S. delegation for appearing to put a weak foot forward, noting how the message of tough talk changed a bit by the time they got to Moscow. Given all we know about Russian hacking and meddling in the 2016 election, what should we do to hold Russia and Vladimir Putin accountable? That's a good question. Um, if they did meddle some, I mean, we can definitely monitor the uh, advertising better. Uh, they didn't, you know, hack any machines or you know, significantly change any outcome, I don't think, uh, at least compared to Germany people uh, having their voting rights taken away. You know, we have fewer voting rights now than we did uh, in the 1960s. As hardly anybody's going out to vote, and those that are trying to vote have, uh, especially in the poorer communities, are waiting six hours in line or not allowed to go because they don't have proper ID. Um, and the best way to combat that is uh, vote by mail, like Oregon. Uh, everybody registered to vote automatically when they turn 18. Uh, you get more people to vote, you won't have to worry about uh, what Russia's advertising on Facebook. Okay. I have a follow-up to that, yeah. um, if you don't mind. How would you police the voting by mail, just out of curiosity? Uh, well, everybody's in the database already. Um, you update your um, everything electronically, and you can do it online. It's really pretty easy. They haven't found any... Um, anybody like trying to get away with anything out there. Okay. Um, so it's not physically putting a stamp on something and mailing it in? No, no, they, they, you're, you're automatically registered, they mail you your ballot, and in the ballot it actually tells you, uh, you can read over what the issues are, the pros and the cons of each issue. Uh, you know, they used to put those in the paper, and they used to tell you they don't do that anymore, right. hardly ever. Um, at least uh, not that I've seen. And uh, you can read over it, take a, take a week to know the issues and really get to learn candidates and, and what you're voting for, and uh, go from there. Okay. Okay, great. Kelly has a next question. Thank you. Reports are coming in throughout the state of the damaging effects of the Trump tariffs, especially with Louisiana farmers and manufacturing. Lobby says they are 
taking a wait and see approach. What would you do as a member of Congress to help our Louisiana businesses from being irreparably harmed? <laughs> wait and see, you know, farmers have the highest suicide rate of any profession. Isn't that crazy? Our number two export is soybeans, mm -hmm. and the number one purchaser of that was China. And they are going to have really, really hard time this year. They, we can't wait to help these people. And the farm bill they just passed, 80% of the money goes to the 10%, top 10% richest companies. You know, the huge agribusiness gets most of the money. And meanwhile, uh, the bottom 30% doesn't get anything. The family farms. We have 300,000 fewer family farms now than we did just 10 years ago. Um, we really need to help these farmers out with uh, subsidies, with finding new trade routes, um, with not uh, upsetting our <laughs> trade partners who are buying everything from us. You're always going to have a trade deficit with the amount that America consumes. We are a huge consumer of everything, and we can't produce it all. So you're going to have a big trade deficit no matter what. But what we need to do is make sure that people that our country that are producing can sell it. And that's the important part. Great, thanks. Uh, now we're going to move on to questions about the domestic questions. Um, the Republican Party plans to balance the one trillion, one trillion dollar budget deficit that they've created uh, by cutting Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. What would you do to ensure that the promises that we make to seniors and hardworking Americans are kept? Well, I, I, I certainly wouldn't make our uh, most needy and vulnerable pay for a tax break for the wealthy. Uh, that's just insane, uh, especially with the, the trillion dollar bailout of Wall Street we just had. Uh, why, why don't we bail out working class people? Why don't we bail out our senior citizens or students with uh, student loan debt that they're going to be paying out for the rest of their lives? Um, uh, seniors and veterans. Uh, having such a hard time already. It's ridiculous to put such a burden on it. And it's so funny, too, that they've been claiming, oh, Social Security's broke for the past, you know, decade. But really, it's $2.9 trillion over budget as a surplus that they're trying to rob from. And We've got to stop that. J just to, to follow up, mm -hmm. like specifically, and, and when you talk about things for giving student loans and all those things cost money. Um, uh, where would you get the money from to pay for programs like that, or where do you think the money should come from? Well, I think it should come from um, corporations that have zero paid zero taxes. Uh, you know, GE, uh, Amazon, hardly anything in taxes. Jeff Bezos makes two hundred and thirty thousand dollars a minute. Meanwhile, his uh, workers. Uh, barely survive on, on what they make, right? And just make it fair. I mean, we're not trying to tax the rich into not being rich anymore. You know, everybody wants to be rich. Um, and everybody deserves an equal chance to. But hey, there should be a limit. In other words, that those who get the most out of the system ought to be putting the most back into the system. Exactly, exactly. Just keep it fair for everybody. Right. right. Level playing field. Great. Thanks. Okay, next question. Being healthy leads to a better quality of life for all Americans. The Affordable Care Act is far from perfect and is under assault right now by the Republican Party. What do you see as the best way to provide quality, cost-efficient health care to all Americans? Well, we have perfect examples of it in Canada and Mexico and Europe and Cuba even it has better health care than we do. Uh, call it medical care for all. Uh, allow people that buy into Medicare, uh, have universal health care, single payer system. Uh, whatever you do, you know, it should be a public op option with um, negotiated pharmaceutical prices and uh, make it available for everybody affordably. As, uh, it costs us so much money, people don't stop getting sick because they don't have health care, right? They still go to the hospital and they still get care, and you still pay for it. But uh, they just don't get that preventative care that would keep them from 
having that ten thousand dollar emergency room bill you know, I'd much rather pay uh, thirty dollars for a doctor visit right uh, what we need is, is universal health care for everybody. It's so much less expensive, and uh, you get a better, much better system. We, we, Canada has a better health care system than we do. Uh, people are calling it, uh, what is it, medical tourism, and going to different countries to get, get care from here, which is ridiculous. We should have the best care in the world, the richest country in the world. Well, it, it also just as a follow-up on that, you talked about that the cost ten thousand dollar emergency room visits, mm -hmm. which really isn't un uncommon. Yeah. But would your plan, when you're talking about universal health care, would that bring down the cost of of that medical providers charge? Oh, it would be. You have a huge amount of cost. You have thousands of different health care plans, right? With thousands of different options and you have to have so much administration to figure out everything that goes with all those plus there's no collective bargaining when you have so many of the different plans if you have one large plan collective bargaining you get the prices down uh, if you were uh, in Canada or Europe you know you'd be paying a tenth of what we pay for health care for not as good health care thanks um, next question has to do with net neutrality. Mm -hmm. The Internet has become a vital resource for conducting business and a critical part of our everyday lives. Right here in Lafayette, innovative programs such as Fiber to the Home has led to business investments and jobs, which is all at risk with the new net neutrality rules by the FCC. Could you describe your position on net neutrality and what exactly you would do as a member of Congress to preserve the Internet as we now know it? Yeah. A lot of people don't understand net neutrality. Uh, it's, it sounds like an abstract idea, but uh, you think of it like uh, your cable, your television cable. Right now, you can go to any website you want to, right? Uh, you can go to Yahoo, you can go to Google, uh, YouTube, whatever you want. Without net neutrality, they can not allow you your Comcast or your whatever internet provider you have can block those sites and make you pay more for them. You can be ending up, ending up with you know a package of websites that you can go to uh, and pay more to look at different things. Plus, it means that they can track you and they know exactly what you're doing, um, which is a definite invasion of privacy. You know, it, the whole idea of the internet and the whole great thing about it is it's so much information that everybody can get you know like Wikipedia um, it's learning and it's entertainment and you shouldn't have to be paying for every little website you want to go to great thanks do you want to go with number five yeah uh, we, sure we had a set schedule sure, with our right. question. Um, <laughs> no no you're, you're no, fine no, you're fine uh with the recent resignation of scott pruitt and the interim head of the environmental protection agency being a coal lobbyist what do you envision as the role of the epa in protecting the environment and regulating businesses uh well it's in the name protection <laughs> environmental protection agency um that's what they're supposed to do it's possible to have um, companies extract and use natural resources without ruining the environment. It's it's completely possible and not unheard of. Um, and you shouldn't be destroying monuments like Bears Ears National Monument. You shouldn't be running leaky pipelines through drinking water of 300,000 people or the Atchafalaya Basin, like they're doing with the Light Ridge Pipeline. Um, you shouldn't be endangering people's life to make a profit. Let me just say, as a follow-up, particularly in Louisiana with the strong influence of the oil and gas industry, that we've been told for a long time that we kind of had to make a choice between, you know, look, you can have a clean environment or you can have good jobs. <laughs> so do you want to work or do you want to have a clean environment? Right. Is that a fair choice? Is that a false choice? No, that's ridiculous. Uh, you, you can have both. It's uh, and they do it all over the country. Um, they just don't here for some reason, even though it's in our constitution to have clean air and water. Um, plus, you know, the, uh, 
people say, you know, I, I've, I've heard it said that I'm anti-oil and gas, but I uh, actually drove here today. Um, uh, that's made out of petroleum products. Uh, what I'm against is the 60% unemployment rate of oil and gas workers. I mean, it's huge. Out of the 60,000 jobs that have been lost in the past 10 years, only about 6,000 have come back. Most of them have gone on to other places, but we're still subsidizing them billions of dollars, the big companies. And workers aren't getting any of that. You know, they're not getting retraining into solar or wind technologies or, you know, any other. Great. Betsy DeVos has shown little regard for America's students and teachers, from stripping students' rights to not supporting teachers in the classroom. What would you do to ensure that America's education system truly leaves no child behind? Yeah, well, um, she has never been to public school. Her kids have never been to public school. Has she even visited a public school? I know she tried to do once, and they chased her away, mm -hmm. protested, chased. I don't even know if she's been to a public school. Um, but boy, education, children, uh, the future, right? How can you not? Uh, fully fund and support education, uh, especially with uh, pre-K, uh, is a huge help in, in uh, especially in under uh, privileged communities. For their, it goes with them with their entire education, uh, for their entire lives. So, yeah, this is the number one thing we need to do is is fully fund uh, pre-K, uh, you know, Head Start programs, um, make sure they have school lunches. They're trying to take away their school lunches. I mean, your kid can't learn if he's too busy thinking about eating. It's just ridiculous. Great, thanks. Now we're going to uh, move into some questions about local and, and state issues. Mm -hmm. um, with the recent failure of the veterans, with the recent failures of the Veterans Administration and the increase in the suicide rate for veterans, how do you envision the VA providing adequate and, and expedient services uh, for those who have sacrificed so much for this country? Yeah. Oh, boy, 22 veterans a day kill themselves. It's awful. Wow. Um, and I, I do a lot of work with the homeless. Um, there are so many of them that are veterans. And I've talked to them that have waited months, you know, one fella in particular at, in a wheelchair in the streets, uh, sleeps in a park bench, that uh, his legs are swollen up so big that it, it, they look like they're gonna pop. And uh, he's gone to, you know, he can go to emergency care every once in a while, uh, but they try and limit that. And he's gone through the VA paperwork and uh, it's just taking forever. You gotta expedite that. You've gotta give them um, mental health care I mean, like, on the spot, immediately, come in and we'll help you. That, that should be first and foremost. Um, this gentleman, too, he was at a business, um, very productive person in society, uh, had a stroke, had health care, uh, had another stroke, and couldn't work anymore, went bankrupt. Now he's on the streets. Uh, and he's a veteran. Uh, something wrong with that. Just a, a, as a follow-up, and, and you mentioned mental health care and, mm -hmm. and PTSD, but it, it also throughout the country, there's also a huge uh, opioid uh, epidemic yeah. that, that we've seen and, and a lot of mental health problems. As a member of Congress, what do you think or, or what do you think that we as a country or, or the federal government should do to try to address those problems? Right. Well, you, you have to get on the, um, do something about the doctors pushing it, like candy, for one. Uh, and also they found out in Colorado and Oregon, Washington, California, marijuana use uh, decreases opioid use by a huge amount. It also helps a lot with PTSD. Now we need to take marijuana off of Schedule One, make it federally uh, legal for testing and so they can, uh, you know, marijuana companies can use federal banks and not be afraid of, uh, you know, being 
raided by the FBI and make it a state issue. That could definitely help everybody, though, and allow the VA to prescribe it. Louisiana pays women 67 cents on the dollar compared to their male counterparts. Women of color make less than 49 cents. With the legislature's inability to pass equal pay legislation, what would you do on a federal level to ensure that the Louisiana women, regardless of race, get equal pay for equal work? Whatever we can. Equal pay, e equal work deserves equal pay, period. That shouldn't even be a question. Um, whether there are enough laws in place that we just aren't utilizing, I don't know. Um, we might have to invoke more penalties on, on companies like that. Uh, I know they have the statistics. They know who's doing it. They're just not enforcing it. Uh, we just we need to really crack down on that. That's, that's just not fair. Um. With Governor Edwards expanding Medicaid in the state, we brought 19,000 new jobs and over $1.5 billion in direct economic impact to the state. Uh, uh, this is kind of a silly question. I think I know what your answer is going to be, but do you support Medicaid expansion? And if so, what would you do to protect it on a federal level? Oh, let me think. Yes. <laughs> they care for everybody. Um, I mean, it, it could even be a... Um, a constitutional amendment that health care is a right, not a privilege. It, you know, it really should be. Nobody should have to worry about, uh, like my friend in the wheelchair, uh, about getting sick and, and losing everything. You know, everybody, 60% of Americans don't are living paycheck to paycheck. They, they get sick and it could be all over for them. 60%. You know, it, it, it's, it's a matter of really national security, I think. So again, as just as a follow-up, yeah. who's going to fund this? Who's going to, what? It's not free. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you, you don't just, uh, I mean, you just don't give people health care. You still are paying for health care. Uh, you buy into it, right? But uh, it's just going to be so much less expensive. Okay. Because of, you know, cooperative bargaining and, a lot less administration. Okay. Um, Louisiana is unique because we are on the convergence of energy and mm -hmm. the environment. How would you protect both the environment and ensure that Louisiana remains a dominant force in energy production? Well, the, the, there was an interesting article in Houston the other day, the capital of oil and gas, and they're moving to renewable energy. They're going solar, they're going wind power, um, they're investing in geothermal and trying to attract more renewable energy uh, companies to Houston, which is exactly what we should be doing. You look at Iowa, um, and this is going to help the farmers too with their trade war dilemma that, that's going to hurt them so much. Um, a lot of Iowa farmers are leasing their land to wind turbines and solar panels and supplementing their income that way, and the, which is creating thousands and thousands of jobs for unemployed oil and gas workers and uh, making a cleaner environment. It's a win-win. Great. Um, next question is, Louisiana does not have a state minimum wage. The cost of living across the state varies from New Orleans to Lake Charles, from Shreveport to, to Slidell. Mm -hmm. um, what would you do on the federal level uh, to ensure that Louisiana residents get a long-awaited raise? And, and if there are, is a minimum wage, what do you think a fair amount uh, would, should be? Well, nobody should work 40 hours a week and still be starving. That's number one. Um, $15 minimum wage uh, would help most people across the country. Uh, and, that's just what's got to be done. We've got to raise the minimum wage. You can't survive on $7 an hour. You, you can barely survive on twice that, $14 an hour. Um, I mean, number one, that's the right thing to do. Number one. Number two, it's costing taxpayers a lot of money because so many people working minimum wage uh, have to rely on government assistance. Mm -hmm. And this is really... Uh, welfare for the corporations 
I, it's it's not helping the people working that much. It's helping Walmart. It's helping uh, you know, fast food places. Uh, but it, it's certainly not helping the people, and it's not helping them. They can never get ahead like that. Now, for bonus points, a living wage um, by area, right? So the Department of Labor keeps statistics on what it takes, how much it, money it takes to survive in different areas. Okay, cities usually much more, you know, say 16, 17, 18 dollars an hour takes to survive in the cities. Rural, rural areas, maybe it's twelve dollars, thirteen dollars an hour. So if you set a minimum wage by uh, the Department of uh, Labor, um, companies are going to be moving out to these rural rural areas, which are, by and large, um, underserved by by uh, manufacturing and corporate communities. But uh, it'll help the rural communities when they move out there. Just to, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of talk in, well, throughout the country these days about the, the incivility that has taken over our political process. Um, if you were elected to Congress, I mean, do you think that you would be able to, to work with people to actually get things done, or do you think the system is, is so broken that uh, it's beyond repair? The system is pretty broken. Um, <laughs> there is so much corporate money in uh, D.C. right now, in Congress, and uh, there are a lot of people that, that we really need to weed out that are only serving corporations and the wealthy. Uh, I, I don't know. If, I mean, you can work with anybody. Everybody has common goals, and I think everybody really wants to help um, make the country better and help people. Um, so yeah, yeah, I mean, you can be civil, but at the same time, you know, when you try and take uh, Social Security away from elderly, or you t try and take food away for kids, uh, there's a time not to be civil. Right. I, I think uh, that just about winds us up on time as far as the uh, question part of the program, um, but I think we have a couple minutes left. If you just want to may look into the camera and tell the voters of the 4th Congressional District why they should vote for you and and, uh, and and what kind of difference you think you could make in Washington. Yeah, sure. Um, well, let's see here. Pretty much everything we covered, uh, everything that I'm for, the Republicans are trying to take away. They, they say they're for the military, uh, but 48 percent of military families are getting food assistance. With the, when we raise the minimum wage to a living wage, we also need to raise it for the military families. Uh, people risking their lives to help our country you know, shouldn't have to be worried about uh, what they're going to put on the dinner table. Uh, we, they're trying to privatize Social Security and rob that fund. Uh, it's just wrong. We need to expand Social Security, if anything. We need to lift senior citizens out of poverty. They shouldn't have to decide between food and prescription pills uh, and their, their, their health care. So, yeah, there, there's so many issues. Uh, we did covered some, but uh, you can go to www.ryantrundle.com and uh, you can see other issues and where I stand on them. Uh, there's also a volunteer button or a donate button, you can do that too. Uh, if you're on Facebook, go to ryantrundle.com uh, for Congress and uh, send me a message. If you have any more questions, I'll, I'll answer them just as fast as I can. Great. Th thanks a lot, Ryan. Thank I, I think we're, we're just about out of time, but, but ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Louisiana Democratic Party and, and AOC Media, I'd like to thank you uh, for joining us tonight for this very uh, informative and entertaining uh, 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 time here with our candidate, Brian Trundle. Thank you and good night. Good night. <laughs>